Actually, um, from again, I usually collect weird little ideas, and I have a box at home where if I if I see something on the like History Channel, I jot a note or an article, I cut it out. A uh, magazine, uh, I throw it in there. It's it's messy, it's jumbly somewhere at the bottom. There's probably mice running around in there. But I like that chaos because weird things end up next to each other, and so that's where a lot of the ideas end up becoming books. It's just weird things being starting to collect together. So I'm going to share some of the weird things I pulled out of that box that became this book. I'm not going to necessarily say how things connect because I don't want to ruin any of the surprises, but I thought I'd just share some of the things. How many people have read any of this book at all? Very few. Okay, good. Of course you have. You've read the whole thing. Well, the first thing that came out of the box actually was, was something I found out when I was researching uh, The Last Oracle. The last oracle dealt with, you know, prophetic visions and, and the oracle of Delphi. And, and so I was doing a lot of research about prophecies in general. And so I, I noticed a trend while I was doing that research that there was a lot of prophecies saying the world's going to end right about now. Now everybody's heard of the Mayan prophecy because it gets a lot of press about the Mayans predicting the end of the world in 2012. Well, that was fine, but it's been sort of overdone and I didn't know, you know, it wasn't interesting enough all by itself. It did not go in my box. But one thing did go in my box. Now, I was, I was raised Roman Catholic, and so you get the saints beaten into you by nuns and their <laughs> rulers. Sorry, Mom. Um, and I came across the story of St. Malachi. Now, St. Malachi was an Irish saint, just a little bit less well-known than St. Patrick. Uh, he's still held in high esteem in, in Ireland. And St. Patrick lived during the 12th century. And according to his story, his history, is that on a pilgrimage to Rome, he had a vision. He wrote down this vision. The vision was of all the popes from his time, the 12th century, until the end of the world. And he wrote short descriptions of each of those popes. 112 popes from the 12th century to the pope that's going to see the world end. Now, the other thing about it, that prophecy, it's called the Prophecy of the Popes. It's fairly famous. If you Google Prophecy of the Popes, you can come with a, a much longer description than I'm going to give you today if you want to delve into it. But basically, each of those little short descriptions ended up to be true. They, they seem to match the Pope. And just for example, Pope John Paul II was described by St. Malachi as from the labor of the sun, which was a metaphor, a common metaphor at the time, for a solar eclipse. And Pope John Paul II was born during a solar eclipse. Rather odd that, you know, centuries before that, that he should be able to make that connection. The current Pope, Pope Benedict. St. Malachi describes Pope Benedict as the glory of the olive. And Pope Benedict got his name from the Benedictine order, whose symbol is the olive branch. So again, all 100 and all these popes seem to match. Now the creepy part of that prophecy, though, is that Pope Benedict, the current Pope, is number 111 on his list. According to St. Malachi, the very next Pope, the one who succeeds Pope Benedict, he describes as Peter the Roman, that Pope is going to reign when the world ends. So as a thriller writer, I'm thinking, cool! <laughs> That's going in the box! <laughs> and there it went, into the box. And then I started seeing other things that, that were, you know, the Mayan, you have the uh, Mayan priests, you have the, uh, uh, the Catholic uh, saints, but there's also some scientific evidence that suggested that maybe the world's going to end sometime soon. There was a, uh, a think tank in Europe called the Club of Rome. In 1972, they published a report called The Limits to Growth, and in that report, they basically did a statistical model showing that at this current rate of population growth, we're going to outstrip our ability to produce enough food to feed that population, which makes sense. Everybody's familiar with a lot of the food riots that were reported over the past year in a lot of third world countries. Uh, food is running short, a lot of starvation going on. Uh, we're close to that tipping point. Uh, that statistical model that was done by the Club of Rome has been repeated by university studies here in the U.S. Same result. What is that result? When that point is hit, because we're going to hit it like a, like a train wreck, when that point is hit, there's going to be such chaos, because we're not going to be prepared for it, that 90% of the world population will die from famine, from chaos, from war, from death. 
and pestilence. Don't forget pestilence. <laughs> Basically, the four, four horsemen of the apocalypse. So I'm thinking, that's cool. <laughs> that's going in the box. So I, that went in the box. So there's the whole doom thing that's going on. My, I don't know why, but that was just going in my head. So that was sort of, I was sort of keyed up on that. And I remember somewhere in that box, I put something that, that was really cool that was related to Doom. And that's the, anybody familiar with the Doomsday Vault? No? The Doomsday Vault was a vault that was just finished in 2008, just last year, by the Norwegian government. They built this huge underground vault underneath a mountain above the Arctic Circle. Uh, it's basically what they did, they're storing a bunch of seed in there, all the different seed from all around the world, they're storing it in that facility. It's called basically the Noah's Ark for seeds because they're afraid of some natural disaster, a man-made disaster, may uh, damage the ecosystems. So they want to preserve the seeds that are around right now, protect that uh, crop diversity. Because we've lost a lot of crop diversity over, these, uh, over the last year, especially recently. Just to give you one example, in the United States, about 100 years ago, there were 7,000 varieties of apples cultivated in the U.S. Today, there's less than 300. So over the course of 100 years, we lost almost all of our varieties of apples that, are, that were normally very common here in the U.S. So their goal was, of course, to um, try to preserve that diversity as much as they could. Now, as a thriller writer, I'm thinking, Malachi is going to end. These scientists say the world's going to end. What does Norway know? <laughs> So then that began, sort of began the, you know, the, the beginning of the storyline. Of course, that's a lot of the history, but there's also, like I said, there's always two parts of my story. There's a lot of history and there's a lot of science. So I thought, well, what am I going to do? What am I going to do with the science? Well, I, when I was looking at the, at the doomsday vault and the preservation of seeds, I started looking into crops, into crop genetics, because I'm looking for the science, something science to play with in there. And I started doing a lot of research about genetically modified plants. Now, probably some of you are familiar with that, where they've, they're, they're genetically modifying corn and wheat to make them more drought resistant or insect resistant so they can use less insecticide, increase crop yields, all good stuff. It's scary. I started doing research, lots of weird stuff going on in that industry. To give you some examples, uh, out of the 40 crops that were um, approved to be grown in the U.S., only eight have published safety studies. The other 32, they're just planted because they could be planted. Now, why is that important? Well, number one is that once you put it out in the world, cast those seeds out there, you have no control over it. Nature is, is uh, you know, is, is very strong and, and strong-willed woman. And weird things happen. Wind blows the pollen around. Rain washes the seeds around. They found these genetically modified plants from test fields. Fields that were like, well, let's just see what this will grow. They found plants for that were supposed to be isolated to this test field growing 30 miles away, growing wild. So again, very lax control going on in that industry. How prevalent is that industry? Well, the industry at this point, 75% of the corn grown in the U.S. is genetically modified. Now, some of it's a little bit odd. There's a, 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 the year 2000, Starlink was a form of corn that was developed. Um, it was only approved for non-human consumption because there were some incidences of allergic reactions to people eating this corn. So it was banned from human use. It was fed to cattle, it was fed to pigs, but not for us. Well, of course, like I said, there's no control in that industry. Things creep out. So over the course of just a matter of a couple of years, that corn ended up in over 300 products, corn products sold in the U.S., including Kellogg's cereal. I'm thinking that's sort of creepy, but sort of cool. <laughs> Did some more research. How creepy is some of that research? This is just one example. Is in 2001, a company called Epicyte developed this corn strain that they were creative enough to actually genetically engineer a contraceptive in it. So that if you ate this corn, you would be sterilized. They developed this, they grew this, it was put out in the market, they advertised it. They got, of course, a lot of bad press. Another company bought their company over. It sort of disappeared. Is it still out there? I don't know. Keep that in mind next time you have a tortilla chip. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I'm reading all this. I'm thinking, now, what if somebody, whether they thought they were doing something good or something foul, decided, I've got something really cool to put into a, a piece of corn or another plant. 
what might happen, who might try to stop them, why are they doing that. That becomes the crux of this story, is that the mishmash of this ancient doomsday uh, prophecies along with what's going on in that industry, and it sort of mash those two together. How they end up mashed together, of course, I don't want to tell you. That's the fun of reading the book. Hopefully it'll be fun of reading the book. So that's how that story came about.